Welcome back to Finish the Fight, a gaming podcast, where we produce and develop the highest quality gaming research in podcast form. I am your host, Alex Kendall. And I am your host, Derek Baker. And today we're going back to the mid-2010s to talk about kind of the start of the Battle Royale craze. You know, we started off with some early mods, eventually made our way into a couple games, and then landed on the game we're talking about today. What's better than just sitting there all by your lonesome and jumping into a party of thousands of people, essentially, it feels like, but you're sitting there, you're having a great time, just, I don't know, going all out, battling people from across the globe over stuff that doesn't really matter. And that's PUBG, baby. And that's, and that's really where we see Battle Royales today. You know, this original Battle Royale theme was created by one man that we'll talk about in a bit, but it kind of established the idea or the basis for most battle royales, you know, start in the air of some vehicle of sorts, drop out with either a squad or by yourself, pick up loot and try and be the last surviving member or team. And we're going to talk about the origins of it, how Players Unknown, which is who we're going to be talking about today, was able to create this and kind of span it out across several games. So today, of course, we're talking about Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, the PUBG, PUBG BB. Let's get into the game. Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, PUBG, also known as PUBG Battlegrounds, is an online multiplayer battle royale game developed and published by PUBG Corporation, a subsidiary of South Korean video game company Blue Hole. The game is based on previous mods that were created by Brendan, quote, Player Unknown Green for other games, inspired by the 2000 Japanese film Battle Royale, and expanded into a standalone game under Green's creative direction. In the game, up to 100 players parachute onto an island and scavenge for weapons and equipment to kill others while avoiding getting killed themselves. The available safe area of the game's map decreases in size over time, directing surviving players into tighter areas to force encounters, the last player or team standing wins the round. PUBG was first released via Steam's early access beta program in March 2017, with a full release in December 2017. The game was also released for the Xbox One via its Xbox Game Preview program that same month and officially released in September 2018. PUBG Mobile, a free-to-play mobile game version for Android and iOS, was released in 2018, in addition to a port for the PlayStation 4. PUBG is one of the best-selling, highest-grossing, and most-played video games of all time. The game has sold over 70 million copies on personal computers and game consoles as of 2020, in addition to PUBG Mobile accumulating 1 billion downloads, that's billion with a B, as of March 2021, and grossing over 4.3 billion with a B on mobile devices as of December 2020. So it's wild to think of this because I know, especially in an American market, which is usually what we talk about, this game had a peak and slowly but surely decreased over time. There's still a small player base here, but we see a lot of the player base over in the Asian markets. And that's what's been keeping it alive for a while. And we'll see various versions actually being made to kind of satisfy those. You know, being a South Korean company and kind of directing and making it for that area, they wanted to expand out. So we're going to talk a bit about Blue Hole and their parent company, PUBG Studios, and their parent company of that, which they make, which is Kraft. So Blue Hole Studio was founded in Seoul, South Korea in March of 2007 by Chang byung yin Chang previously established Neowiz in 1997, moved on to found search engine developer First Snow in 2005, and sold Adventure in 2006. The total company of Blue Hole Studio announced on April 22, 2015, that they had changed their name to simply Blue Hole. And we'll talk about PUBG Studio. So PUBG Studios, formerly Gino Games, Blue Hole Gino Games, and PUBG Corporation is an internal studio of Blue Holes that developed one of the establishing Battle Royale games, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. Originally, Juno Games had been founded by Kim Chang Han to develop MMOs, but around 2014, he had been forced to lay off a third of his staff 
as their last product uh, didn't do so well. He sold Juno Games to Blue Hole on January 27th, 2015, with the sale to close on March 27th of that year. Shortly after Blue Hole's acquisition in 2015, Chang Han reached out to Green to offer him support to build out his battle royale at Blue Hole Geno, which Green accepted. Following the success of PUBG in 2017, Blue Hole Geno Games was renamed PUBG Corporation in September of 2017. A second office was established in Madison, Wisconsin in late 2017, with two further offices in Amsterdam and Japan. On March 12, 2018, PUBG Corporation acquired New York-based studio Mad Glory, which was renamed PUBG Mad Glory. Green, having been based in the sole offices of PUBG Corporation, left that division in March 2019 to lead a new subsidiary, PUBG Special Projects, at the Amsterdam office, later renamed to PUBG Productions. At the end of 2019, Tencent announced some big plans for PUBG in India's upcoming future, as well as its general esports. Krafton fully merged PUBG Corporation into their internal studio system in December 2020, rebranding the team to PUBG Studios. So a lot of PUBG thrown around in that, but basically what happened is these smaller studios got swallowed up, got together, and they formed Krafton. Not, not the macaroni and cheese, but Krafton. So, you know, you put the macaroni and cheese on things. Oh. Uh, as as kind of like an alphabet. You know how Google made Alphabet to be a parent company? They made Krafton to be an, an a parent company to all these smaller subsidiaries, making it easy to manage all the different PUBGs going on. Dangerously cheesy. Dangerously cheesy. So let's talk about the development of the game, because it's very interesting how this came about, because it really started out as just a random mod. The game's concept and design was led by Brendan Green, also known by his online handle, PlayerUnknown, who had previously created the Arma 2 mod, DayZ, Battle Royale, an offshoot of the popular mod DayZ, and inspired by the 2000 Japanese film Battle Royale. At the time he created DayZ, Battle Royale, around 2013, Irish-born Green had been living in Brazil for a few years as a photographer, graphic designer, web designer, and played video games such as Delta Force Black Hawk Down and America's Army. The DayZ mod caught his interest, both as a realistic military simulation and its open-ended gameplay. He started playing around with the custom server, learning programming as he went along. Green found most multiplayer first-person shooters too repetitive, considering maps small and easy to memorize. He wanted to create something with more random aspects so that players would not know what to expect, creating a high degree of replayability. This was done by creating vastly larger maps that could not be easily memorized and using random item placement across it. Green was also inspired by an online competition for DayZ called Survivor GameZ, which featured a number of Twitch and YouTube streamers fighting until only a few were left. Since he was not a streamer himself, Green wanted to create a similar game mode that anyone could play. His first iterations of this mod were more inspired by the Hunger Games novels, where players would try to fight for stockpiles of weapons at the center location, but move away from this partially to give players a better chance at survival by spreading weapons around and also to avoid, you know, a little thing called copyright. In taking inspiration from the Battle Royale film, Green had wanted to use square safe areas, but his inexperience with coding led him to use circular safe areas instead, which persisted in the battlegrounds and has pretty much persisted in most every single other Battle Royale out there. Copyright, copy tight. Am I right, Alex? You are copyright, copy tight with that. When DayZ became its own standalone title, interest in his Arma 2 version of the Battle Royale mod trailed off and Green transitioned development of the mod to Arma 3. Sony Online Entertainment had become interested in Green's work and brought him on as a consultant to develop H1Z1, licensing the Battle Royale idea from him. In February 2016, Sony Online split H1Z1 into two separate games, the survival mode H1Z1, Just Survive, and the battle royale-like H1Z1, King of the Kill, around the time that Green's consultation period was over. King of the Kill is a genius. Right? Isn't that awesome? I love that. 
Separately, the Seoul-based studio Jino Games, led by Chang Han Kim and who developed MMOs for PCs, was acquired and renamed Blue Hole Jino Games by Blue Hole in January 2015, a major South Korean publisher of MMOs and mobile games. Kim recognized that producing a successful game in South Korea generally meant it would be published globally. It wanted to use his team to create a successful title for PC players that followed the same model as other mobile games published by Blue Hole. He had already been excited about making a type of Battle Royale game after he had played DayZ, in part that the format had not caught on in Korea yet. He also wanted to make this through an early access model and have a very limited development schedule to get the game out as quickly as possible, while treating the product as a games-as-a-service model to be able to support it for many years. And researching what had been done, he came across Green's mods and reached out to him. So yeah, this is kind of the start of that games as a service instead of games as a product. So constantly updating it, adding new features, tweaking things, and really setting this, you know, setting the standard for some esports. Around the same time that Green left Sony Online, Kim contacted and offered him the opportunity to work on a new Battle Royale concept. Within a week, Green flew out to Blue Hole's headquarters in Korea to discuss the options, and a few weeks later, became the creative director of Blue Hole. He moved to South Korea to oversee development, and according to Green, this was the first time a Korean game studio had brought aboard a foreigner for a creative director role. And, while at risk, he says that his relationship with Blue Hole's management is strong, allowing Green's team to work autonomously with little to no oversight, you know, allowing them to really make what they want to make. Development began in early 2016 and was publicly announced that June, with plans to have the game ready within a year. Blue Hole started with a team of about 35 developers supporting Green's work, but had expanded to 70 by June 2017. Green stated that many of these developers were voluntarily putting in long work hours into the game due to their dedication to the project and not by any mandate from himself or Blue Hole's management. Mm. Wink, wink. Wink, wink. <laughs> With the rapid growth and in interest in the game, Blue Hole spun out the entire development for Battlegrounds into Blue Hole Geno Games in September 2017, which was renamed PUBG Corporation with Kim as its chief executive officer. PUBG Corporation continued the development of the game and its marketing and growth, opening an office in the United States with plans for future ones in Europe and Japan. In August 2018, PUBG Corporation launched the, quote, Fix PUBG campaign, acknowledging that the game still had several lingering bugs and other performance issues. The campaign finished in November with PUBG Corporation calling it a success as everything listed had been implemented by then. In March 2019, Green announced that he was stepping down as the game's lead designer, but would still serve as a creative consultant. Taesok Jang, the game's art director, would replace him, with Green relocating to PUBG's studio in Amsterdam, PUBG's special projects. Green stated that he believed the main Battlegrounds team was at a place to continue developing the game in the direction he had set to keep the game unique among the other Battle Royale games that had launched, and he wanted to try something not tied to Battle Royale, but still multiplayer-based. The move also put him closer to his family in Ireland. And with the success of PUBG, Bluehole created Crafted as a holding company for its video game assets and studios in 2018, taking over the publishing duties for PUBG and related games. By December 2020, Crafted merged PUBG Corporation into their internal studio system, rebranding the team as PUBG Studios. In a statement issued to PC Gamer in August 2021, publisher Crafton confirmed the Battle Royale title is now officially called PUBG Battlegrounds. So it's Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, Battlegrounds, or ATM Machine. <laughs> if there's one thing that I love, it's doubling up on one word. You gotta do it, baby. And so here is a quote from the company talking about where they're going and kind of where they're seeing stuff happening. Crafton is actively expanding the PUBG brand through a variety of new experiences set in its universe, the company said. Rebranding Player Unknown's Battlegrounds to PUBG Battlegrounds is the first step in us realizing this vision. Additional titles in the franchise will carry the PUBG name, as you will see in the upcoming game, PUBG New State, it added. 
Did you just say use? As use, we'll see. As use, no, we'll I'm, all I'm see. here for it. Yeah. Listen, as use, we'll all see here. So right now we're it had a my that, cousin Vinny vibe to that. I, I like that. That's what I'm going for, baby. So as we're seeing, Crafton being kind of his holdings company again, very similar to like Alphabet and Google, is now trying to expand out that PUBG lineage of games. You know, we started with Player Unknown Battlegrounds, and we're now seeing more and more games that are going to be under this banner. They're trying to go like that Call of Duty route of expanding out into various you know different aspects, because I think they understand they've got their market targeted especially in asia and east asia but in the u.s and the west you're looking at Fortnite, you're looking at warzone you're looking at apex legends that are really dominating the market over here so they're trying to expand out and see how else can we use that PUBG name into newer titles yeah we got these utes out here that are just looking for battle royales but they you know the utes don't know what to do Mm -hmm. sorry that's more of my cousin Vinny. let's talk about the design Battlegrounds represents the standalone version of what Green believes is the final version of the Battle Royale concept, incorporating the elements he had designed in previous iterations. Faster development was possible with the game's engine, Unreal 4, compared with Arma and H1Z1, which were built with proprietary game engines. Green acknowledged that implementing the size of the maps in Battlegrounds has been one of the challenges with working with Unreal, which was not designed with such maps in mind. The game was designed as a mix between the realistic simulation of Arma 3 and the arcade-like action focus and player accessibility of H1Z1. Based on Green's experience with the genre, an island with many terrain features was picked as the first map known as Erangel. The map design scope was to offer players many possible options for strategic and unique gameplay. Some buildings and structures were designed to depict the style of the brutalist architecture of the Soviet Union during the 1950s. The developer team playtested architectural features and random item placement systems, looking at both how close quarters encounters went and for open terrain areas. The goal was to optimize the right distribution and placement of weapons and gear across the map to encourage players to make strategic decisions about how to proceed in the game without overly penalizing players who may not find weapons within the first few minutes of the round. During early access, additional maps were planned, such as one set on a fictional island in the Adriatic Sea that included snow-covered Yugoslavian territories. Green stated that he thought the Erangel map felt disjointed despite meeting their goals for gameplay and sought to create more unified ideas with future maps. So yeah, as Derek had stated, this was kind of the end-all, be-all idea of a battle royale in gaming. And again, we've seen that adaptation all over where a bunch of different companies have taken their own liberties in what it is, but for the most part, getting a ship thing, jump out, land, grab some stuff, survive, and have that ring ever closing in on you. The free fall from an airplane at the start of each match was a new feature for the genre to encourage strategy between staying with the pack of players or seeking out one's own route for a better chance at finding good loot and honestly survival. With the added parachute drop, Green considered that Battlegrounds or PUBG had three distinct subgames. One, the airdrop during which one must quickly figure out the best time to jump and where to land in relationship to the other players. Two, the loot game of knowing where and how to gather the best possible equipment, and three, the combat game with the other players. Winners of a match are greeted with the phrase, winner, winner, chicken dinner. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. An idiom that Green had used in his prior Battle Royale games and kept in with PUBG, which itself had origins as early as the Great Depression era. And that explains why my grandma used to say that to me all the time. Mm Mm-hmm, because she was a PUBG player. She must have been a PUBG player. Must have Just, loved the PUBG. She was super dead by then, but yeah. <laughs> Inspired by Derek's grandma. <laughs> Green also introduced microtransactions that allow players to use real-world funds to purchase loot crates that provide randomly selected cosmetic items, also known as skins, which they can trade with other players. So kind of the early era of that loot drop system, or the loot crates, I should say. While Green recognizes the issue with skin gambling, He believes that Valve has put safeguards in place to support a, quote, skin economy. 
However, by November 2017, a gray market skin gambling sites began to appear that used PUBG cosmetics as virtual currency. Following controversy over the use of loot boxes to offer pay-to-win items in other games in November 2017, the PUBG Corporation affirmed and doubled down that while they will continue to add new cosmetic items rewarded by in-game crate purchases, they would never add anything that affects or alters gameplay. In May 2018, PUBG Corporation disabled the ability to trade skins on the Steam marketplace as they found that players were still abusing the system by selling them for monetary value through unofficial third-party platforms. While still in early access, Bluehole offered an early preview of the system by offering time-limited crates that could be purchased during the first Battlegrounds Invitations tournament during Gamescom in August of 2017, with the sales from these contributing to the prize pool. Among loot from these crates were special outfits inspired by the original Battle Royale film. So let's go into that. When it comes to other illegal monetary abuse of the game, the game uses the Battle Eye anti cheating software to prevent in game cheating, such as wall hacks and aimbotting. The software is permanently banned over 13 million players by October of 2018, and Battle Eye indicated that 99% of all cheating software for the game was developed in China. And I think we're still seeing that a lot of games is a lot of people will buy a cheap wall hack, a cheap aim bot, a cheap sprint, you know, permanent sprint thing that is this piggyback thing. We see it especially in Call of Duty Warzone, which they're cracking down on, especially on uh, the accounts. But we've seen it in all the major ones, even in tournaments. With it's, been around, it's been around forever. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, yeah, now there are bots that help. Sure. But like turbo controllers were a big console thing mm-hmm. as far as shooters go. Whenever you were able to, and, and maybe it was just couch co-op. Maybe it was just sitting there with your friends, but you turn on the, the turbo button. Now all of a sudden your trigger button has doubled. And so it's always been yeah. an issue. People have always been looking to do this, but. But now we're seeing, I think the repercussions of it, especially when a lot of monetary gain is involved. And it's not just you and your friends playing or playing for fun online. It could be for money. It could be for getting those loot crates and then selling those skins on the gray market. So it it definitely starts to really attribute and attack those player bases when you can't just play with friends, when you have to match up with 100 people or match up with 60 or match up with 40, whatever game you're playing, you got to be those people. And that's where they need to make sure they even those odds. 100% a valid argument. The game also features custom game modes and modding support. He considered modding support an essential part of the full release, as just as he had to start with mods, he wanted to enable others to create variations on his game so that he could find, quote, the next player unknown. This was aided by a quiet release of custom service support to a number of influential streamers, which subsequently made it into public release. These servers allow the host to change a number of factors, like how fast the safety circle constricts, the weapons being used, and who can join. By using a password, players can create their own private games, get their viewers in, and set rules of their own. Rounds can be melee weapons only, maybe just shotguns, loads of loot, hardly any loot, any possible combination. And this, I love and i'm missing it from some of my favorite battle royales i'm a big apex legends player i absolutely love the game i am marginal at it but it's fun and i want to have a tournament with my friends or a private server with my friends to be able to play around on and it's just not something that they can handle or want to do right now potentially down the road that's a thing but i love this aspect of the game and really it just heightens the life of the game it makes you want to keep coming back to be like derek we're going to jump into call of duty Warzone." Only, only fists. And like everyone's got to make their way to the middle. I mean, I'm thinking back even to the Halo days. Mm-hmm. Halo 3, if, if that game did not have the custom game modes, I wouldn't have continued playing it. No. I wanted to go in and play Griff Ball. I yeah. wanted to play the SWAT mode. You know, there are ultimately different modes that make these games interesting. They give mm-hmm. them longevity. And it's, it's just good to have that variability. And not only that, as we've seen in Halo and plenty of other games, a lot of game modes, even like some map additions, are user-created. 
you know, as a developer and a creator, you don't have all the ideas in your head. You guys can spitball back and forth in the office, but when you give into the hands of the creators, especially in the Halo case when they made Forge and allowed players just to mess with almost everything, and when they got to Halo 5, mess with basically everything, that's how it shifted and kept a player base going. So on that note, in one case, zombie mode, all but four players pretend to be zombies who may sometimes distinguish themselves by removing all clothing and are limited only to collecting melee weapons and consumable items. It must rush to attack the other four players who are able to collect all gear and attempt to outrun and defeat all the zombies. Inspired by this mode, Green announced plans to introduce an official zombie-based gameplay mode based on this into PUBG. Whereas most of the rest of the team continued to develop the core gameplay and maps, Green is taking on the zombie mode as a near solo project, only using the assistance of the lead animator to help with the zombie animations. Green sees PUBG as a platform and would like to see more custom game types and mods developed by players for it, Green identified that some mods that he also previously worked on from Arma 3 may become a PUBG platform, and he wants to incorporate the game with streaming services like Twitch that would enable replays or other features amenable to treating PUBG as an eSport, calling this an ultimate end goal for his development. But he wanted to let the nature of how it would play out uh, play out naturally with players. And that's exactly where we're seeing it, especially as Green stepped down and moved across. We did see the zombie mode. We've seen some other modes that have entered their way in and have drawn streamers to it, have drawn YouTubers to it. And that's our next topic we're really going to bring up is the marketing and how on basically a minimalist zero budget at times, this game took off. So marketing for PUBG or the, the main line of the game is mostly on word of mouth streamers, and an internet presence. And I'll discuss the variations below. I have that more in depth. But for now, let me just bring up this quote that Green said basically with an interview with IGN saying, quote, we publish on Steam, you know? And that's allowed us to sell millions of copies without having any marketing budget essentially, or store copy. We have shown that you don't need necessarily the same marketing or PR budget as a AAA game to sell a lot of copies. Now, for the marketing of PUBG Mobile, Krafton turned towards Combo Strike, a full-service marketing and advertising agency focused solely on the gaming industry. According to their website, Combo Strike, quote, managed the direct influencer and PR strategy for Tencent's PUBG Mobile launch in EU and LATAM, or Latin America, and the US, from soft launch to global launch to growth stage. The initial launch stage goal was to help win share of voice and acquire quality users. After becoming the number one most downloaded game in over 100 countries, the goal was then shifted to sustaining growth through creation of viral content. Big words to say, once we big, make the streamers help us. I mean, that's to become one of the most popular games in 100 plus countries. Oh, yeah. You've, you've definitely done what you wanted to do, right? So for them to start focusing in on well, we don't really need to necessarily do anything more to establish growth. We just need to help make sure that streamers are able to use our product mm -hmm. and we're able to reach more people through that. I feel like that's a, a very valid marketing strategy. And on top of that, like you feel like you've made a good game. And that's it, especially in a marketing sense. Like This was just a PR like gold mine. Typically hear about PR disasters or things going downhill. No, no, no. They're already going into this being like, oh, pretty simple. Exactly. The marketing was twofold. Influencer marketing and public relations support. To boost viewership, engagement, and direct response, Combo Strike carefully selected key influencers based on game fit, efficiency, and capability. The agency chose two major YouTubers to present the game in a gameplay Quote, let's play style video. We're all very familiar. PewDiePie. Mm -hmm. First was Squeezy, who is France's number two biggest YouTuber and the number one biggest gaming YouTuber with a fan base of over 11.8 million subscribers 
He started out as a gaming influencer and now offers more creative and diverse content, often using video games as a basis for his comedy videos. In his video, Squeezy played the PUBG mobile game and garnered over 6.6 .6 million views and over 11,000 comments. Second was Vegeta777, who is one of the biggest Spanish-speaking video game channels and in this video plays PUBG Mobile, obtaining over 2.9 million views and over 13,000 comments. In addition, they also work with Corridor Digital, an American production studio based in Los Angeles, known for creating pop culture-related viral online short film videos since 2010, to produce a movie for PUBG Mobile that was very well received with over 8.1 million, that's with an M, views in over 6,000 comments. For the PR support, Combustrike conducted a series of press releases, media alerts, follow-up, press inquiry management, additional consultancy on exclusive interviews, as well as daily qualitative and quantitative coverage reporting. The results of the PR campaign were excellent, with coverage in top-tier tech, gaming, and mobile niche publications, primarily within German-speaking and Latin American countries. So yeah, all this to say, of this firm, basically hired out once PUBG Mobile hit, which is later down the road, did an excellent job just reaching out to those YouTubers, to those people that have that influence, especially in the markets they're targeting, and it did pretty well. Let's talk about the gameplay of some PUBG. Most of you know it or have played a game like it, but let's break down the old nitty gritty. Battlegrounds is a player versus player shooter game in which up to 100 players fight in a battle royale, a type of large scale last man standing deathmatch where players fight to remain the last one alive. Players can choose to enter the match solo, duo, or with a small team of up to four people. As we had said, the last person or team alive wins the match. Each match starts with players parachuting from a plane onto one of the four maps, with areas of approximately 8x8 kilometers, 6x6 kilometers, and 4x4 kilometers in size. The plane's flight path across the map varies with each round, requiring players to quickly determine the best time to eject and parachute to the ground. Players start with no gear beyond customized clothing selections, which do nothing to affect that gameplay. Once they land, players can search buildings, ghost towns, and other sites to find weapons, vehicles, armor, and other equipment. These items are procedurally distributed throughout the map at the start of a match, with certain high-risk zones typically having better equipment. Killed players can be looted to acquire their gear, making it well worth the time to stop and check. Players can opt to play either from the first-person or third-person perspective, each having their own advantages and disadvantages in combat and situational awareness. Though, server-specific settings can be used to force all players into one perspective to eliminate eh, some advantages. I've never seen anyone play this game other than in the third-person perspective. So, it's a nice switch if, like, let's say you're using a longer rifle that you, like, switch to first-person to sight it up and to jump into combat. But for the most part, especially situational awareness, you want to stay in that third person because you can peek around walls, you can see much more of the area around you. It really, I was never a big PUBG player, but from the streamers I used to watch, it's much more of that like switch to it for combat, jump back out of it if you don't see them to see where they are and then jump back in. So it's a very quick back and forth. Who doesn't love Lakitu following them around, right? That's, that is very true. Every few minutes, the playable area of the map begins to shrink down towards a random location with any player caught outside the safe area taking damage incrementally and eventually being eliminated if the safe zone is not entered in that time period. In game, the players see the boundary as a shimmering blue wall that contracts over time. This results in a more confined map, in turn increasing the chances of encounters. During the course of a match, Random regions of the map are highlighted in red and bombed, posing a threat to players who remain in that area. In both cases, players are warned a few minutes before these events, giving them time to relocate to safety. A plane will fly over various parts of the playable map, occasionally at random, or wherever a player uses a flare gun and drop a loot package, containing items which are typically unobtainable during normal gameplay. 
These packages emit highly visible red smoke, drawing interested players near it and creating further confrontations. On average, a full round takes no more than 30 minutes. At the completion of each round, players gain in-game currency based on their performance. The currency is used to purchase crates, which contain cosmetic items for character or weapon customization. A rotating event mode was added to the game in March 2018. These events change up the normal game rules, such as establishing larger teams or squads, or altering the distribution of weapons and armor across the game map. Yeah, we've seen this happen across a variety of games, not just like Battlegrounds or Battle Royale games, but we see that daily events are added in to give more of a challenge or to get you to come back, even in sports games. You know, you have these daily challenges that would pop in just to make you want to play it or make you at least spend an hour or so on the game. One, to increase their daily player rates, but two, just to keep that replayability of coming back to accomplish, you know, at least something. Now, this is where I'll dive a bit more especially into the marketing of it, but also the multiplayer, which is the whole game. But first, let's talk about Twitch and YouTube's influence on it. Player Unknown's Battlegrounds has been a massive hit with gamers even before being officially launched, and it's being polished with every new patch. The team's willingness to listen to its fans, as well as the game's simplicity and randomness, has made it perfect for streamers trying to build a following. But the relationship hasn't been entirely one-sided either. Streaming has played a major role in its growth in popularity. Quote, The heart and soul of Battle Royale, the idea of looting, then fighting with other players, is good for streamers, especially the starting part, Green has explained to New York Times Magazine. Quote, It's a bit slower, gives streamers a chance to interact with their chat or, you know, audience members, and then there's action later. Without a lot of hype around the game and H1Z1 still dominating the market, they also knew there was skepticism about the studio's ability to deliver on the game. To fight that, they would reach out to people who would support them because that initially small group would be the ones to amplify their message and support the game in the long run. And so I, I agree with this. I think that what's interesting about PUBG is... You start out kind of alone, mm -hmm. and then you have an interaction with a person. And a lot of times, a lot of the things that I've seen are comical interactions. And I'm sure that those are the ones that get saved. But it, it really is just sort of a, well, hey, you're not really my friend. I don't know you at all. We're just happening to raid the same area right now. And communicating in that way, I don't know why this particular play style and this particular game leads to more interesting interactions like that. Um, but maybe it's, it's because of how big the maps are, because mm -hmm. of how big the areas are before you actually interact with other people. Because, you know, going back to playing like Halo 2, Halo 3, we were all just basically going down and the Battle Royale was in one room. And so you'd have interactions there. But that was basically it. And so that's what makes this game so interesting to me is you're able to kind of like drop in all over the place. And when you see mm -hmm. another guy, it's more, it's more so like a, oh, man, here's a guy. Yep. I don't know how things are going to go, but uh, hopefully they go well. And sometimes it leads to like a fight, and sometimes it leads to a really funny interaction. So. It, it, it is. And that's how Battle Royales, especially when it comes to streaming and talking with your audience, it's always different. It's not like a, like you said, Halo match or a Call of Duty match where you know what guns you're spawning in with, you got to hit a certain number, bam, you're done. Because the other thing with those is there's no really recourse to dying. You're going to respawn. Whereas this is, if you're dead, you're dead. So you have to manage that. And like when you watch streamers, especially good ones that start to work really well with any battle royale, it's just entertaining to see those things occur. And like you said, those funny things of like, you and that guy stare each other down, don't have a weapon yet, and you do like little squats at each other. <laughs> you run like, hey, into one of the rooms in this abandoned house, like, who's going to be the first one to find a gun? Mm -hmm. And then that's how that game goes. It's very it's, interesting. It's, it's, it is interesting. So Kang, that we've heard about earlier, had this to say about content creators and really what their relationship was. Quote, what was also important was that content creators are always looking for new content. 
especially the lower tier ones who are looking for something that's unique to differentiate their channels from the bigger ones. A lot of bigger, top tier streamers will only play your game if it's mainstream, or if it will grow their viewership as well, or if it's a hot topic for the week. And added, we had to be at least mildly successful on Twitch to promote our game with a $0 budget. And Kane continues stating, we knew this could be our go-to marketing strategy from the very beginning. Kang was giving out so many keys to streamers through Twitter direct messages that during the closed beta, she actually discovered that there is a limit between 300 to 500 direct messages in a day, and the service shuts off your ability to send more until the next day. I mean, I, I understand kind of why it's there. So like if your account gets hacked, you don't message like 20,000 people like, oh, check this link out. But at the same time, it's like, oh, guys, I, I'm so sorry. Like, I'll have to get to some of you tomorrow. I have no idea. Yeah, it's pretty wild that that was the response, but it makes sense. And Kang said, streamers really want to talk to the developers. They really appreciate it when you approach them, give them information. Even if it's just a couple Twitter DMs, they want to talk to the developers or the community manager. They don't want to talk to your PR guy. I 100% associate with that just based on this podcast alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and Kang was right. You know, her taking this initiative, just reach out to people and, and, and push this game. Be like, yeah, I'm going to help out as much as we can. Even if it's like, no, I can't help you with that. It's so much better to hear it from an actual person working on the game than some PR management that's like, we are so sorry for your end results that you have achieved. We will be messaging you within 24 to 48 hours. Like some, some random garble like that. It's just so nice to get like the boots on the ground type stuff. Very much like what Gaben does with Steam. You just email him and he's like, I'll get to you. Kang continued, it helps build personal relationships, especially being responsive to their requests at all hours of the day. If you're engaging with them directly, even after your game has traction, they will remember that and help you to distribute it and talk positively about the game. To better understand what streamers and viewers wanted from their content, Kang also spent three months streaming games herself and watched an inordinate amount of gaming streams. At one point, she was subscribing to 50 different streamers and paying out of pocket to do so. A degree of support, she said, helped build special relationships with many of the game's most devoted supporters. So to give you guys an idea on what that costs, that's about $250 a month she's throwing out there. So about if she's doing like the low tier of $5, yeah, $250 well, a month. Well, and it's, I think it's important to note at this point, PUBG is not a big game. So it's... Like, you think about it now, and it's like the PUBG creator mm -hmm. spending time with streamers doesn't seem like that big of a deal. But sure. at the time, it's like, here's my random game. You know, here's my small-time game. And it's great to see that in today's era, because we even see that with indie games or even some, like, smaller, bigger games, I should say, like, not AAA titles, but higher up there. Oh, yeah, there's devs jumping in. Even in, uh, you know, a couple bigger streams, they'll be like, hey, I'm here. If you have any questions or any concerns or whatever I can help with, I'm just kind of watching along. And so lastly, Kang remarks, content creators and Twitch streamers have to be a part of your marketing plan if you don't have a budget. They'll help if you build the relationship the right way, but they're not marketing tools. A lot of publishers pay them to play the game, but they're not going to be able to build a relationship by doing that. It's a one-off thing. Streamers have to be emotionally invested. To do that, you have to commit to building a mutually beneficial relationship with them. 1,000%. I mean, you can pay them. I mean, very much how Apex started. Apex was very much like this, where it just hot dropped one day. There was no news on it. No one knew it was coming. And it just came out. But you had the big streamers playing it. They were paid a lot of money to do it. But it did work in that case. I think people were already attuned to Battle Royales and to Titanfall, which is kind of where this whole universe is based. So they already had that. But if you're trying to do a new game and you're like, all right, our marketing budget's 300,000, we're going to pay streamers. Yeah, they may play it for the allotted time they're supposed to, but then they're like, oh, that game sucks. Like I was paid to play it for two weeks and now I'm done. Whereas a lot of these better games, newer games, like, you know, with PUBG or even with Apex, I keep bringing up. Yeah, they were paid to do it, but they stayed on. Well, like a good game is a good game, right? Mm -hmm. But if you don't get it in front of the right people, it 
a lot of times I think in this new marketing environment is going to fail. Like it does help. Indie games get more support. When I think back to the early days of PewDiePie, I used to watch that guy when he was, you know, streaming to less than a hundred thousand people. And when you think about how a game can be associated so much with a person and how much fun you could witness, I think, while watching them stream, like it really does lend itself to the playability of the game. It does. I get that. Again, Apex, my game, but I watch a lot of Apex streamers now just because one, they're amazing. And two, it does build that hype factor back up for me. If I don't touch Apex for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, I'm like, ooh, dang, that actually looks really fun. Let me jump back into that. Yeah. And that would help sell that stuff just so much more. And they were smart to do it. Now, another big point for multiplayer and just for kind of marketing the game was esports. To celebrate the game surpassing 2 million copies sold, Bluehole announced a 2017 charity invitational event, inviting 128 players to compete over their official Twitch channel to raise money for the Gamers Outreach Foundation, with Bluehole matching all donations up to $100,000. The competition ran in early May 2017 and raised at least $120,000 from viewers, along with Bluehole's $100,000 match, and served as a prototype for future esports events for the game. During the August 2017 Gamescom event, Bluehole and ESL, or Esports Live, organized the first Battlegrounds Invitational Tournament with a $350,000 prize pool. Separate events were held for solo players, two-player teams, two-player teams fixed to first-person perspective, and four-player squads. Each event featured three matches, with the player or team scoring the highest across all three named winners. Green said that while he had envisioned the Battle Royale format to be a spectator sport since his Arma 2 mod, their approach to making Battlegrounds an eSport would be a matter of taking eh, baby steps. Green said that they would not actively pursue eSports until after the game was fully released and that all major bugs were eliminated. The Gamescom 2017 event demonstrated the issues surrounding the logistics of running a large Battlegrounds tournament and with a large number of players involved. And they had to work along ESL to explore how to do this effectively in the future. Further, Green stated there was also the need to establish a format for presenting a Battlegrounds match to make it interesting to the spectators, which he thought would take some time to develop given the nature of the emergent gameplay, comparing it to established first-person shooters and multiplayer online Battle Arena esports games. A 20-team 80-player tournament with a $200,000 prize pool was organized by Intel in Oakland of November 2017, kind of capping the rest of that year out. And he's very much right. It is tough to figure out a camera system or a full-on production system, basically. How do you send this out like you would a sports game or, you know, a a shooter match like Call of Duty that's only featuring a few players from fixed perspectives? Now you've got 100 people, several different teams, and then Think about even just the 100 people for the one person match, 100 perspectives you got to kind of track. Like it's wild. Yeah, there are so many advantages that you can have depending on how you decide to approach PUBG. And so this game, I do feel like while it has great esports potential, it is sort of like a challenge in a way to where you've, you've offered almost too much accessibility, you've offered almost too many options Mm -hmm. and so when you're talking about an esport there has to be some level of standardization and that could be hard to achieve in a game like this it very much is i mean we even see that in a lot of the tournaments that are going on with other battle royales it's tough for them to be like okay which team of these 20 teams or these 50 teams do we follow like yeah we know our big name players but what if they get a bad landing And someone gets a shotgun right next to them and boom, that team's wiped. You know, like who do we actually track with this? So it's still an evolving format. Um, You know, Overwatch did it extremely well following two teams having, I think they had like eight camera ops every match. And it was super, super amazing. So if they can get to that level and quality of like enjoyability to it, your audience is going to skyrocket. Well, let's hop over to one of my favorite parts of all these episodes, the music mm-hmm. and sound. While not containing an overall soundtrack, the game does have a main theme that plays before and after rounds. B 
Because the game was not going to have a lot of music playing, there was enough money to hire a big-name composer, producer Brendan Green, and the rest of the PUBG team searched extensively before deciding upon Tom Salta, whose previous work has included Halo and several Tom Clancy games. By bringing a big-name composer like Salta, more people would be willing to try out the new game. I 100% agree with this. Like, music is something that I feel like it's overlooked so much in video games mm-hmm. by more casual players. But when you have a great soundtrack, especially by, you know, someone like Tom Salta, like, uh, I'm more interested in the game. There's obviously something there to draw me to that. And it's that song you're going to hear over and over and over and <laughs> over again. So you got to make it something that players can recognize and really enjoy that. And that is a struggle. Like who do you find to make like the perfect one track soundtrack that is the only song that will play to make sure it's not a monotonous thing that turns players off. Absolutely. So when deciding the mood of how the track should sound, the development team were looking for an exciting track that sounded both orchestral and electronic. When combined with a large buildup prior to the start of the match, the players would almost certainly stay determined and confident going into the round. Much of the track soundscape is taken up by synthesizers, with some creating a soft pad for the other instruments to sit on. The main melody features French horns with interjections of electronic percussion, the perfect hybrid of orchestral and electronic. Mm Mm-hmm. When PUBG Mobile released, several additional tracks were created by Mason Lieberman in addition to Salta's main track. So yeah, so PUBG brought a little bit more with it, especially being on the mobile phone. You're fully distracted when you're playing it type thing, played on the go. Need a little something to spice it up. Again, another amazing composer, masterful composer to bring in for the mobile version as well. And we all love like the true orchestral themes and things like that, but it's this is a game where they really kind of brought together just the availability of electronic music in addition mm-hmm. to the orchestral knowledge. It's a really nice blend. And it works. And unfortunately, or fortunately, no vinyl, but it is available to download iTunes, other places for a little 99 cheeky cents. Oh, baby. Now, this section typically is, goes by pretty quick, but I wanted to add a bunch more information that's actually a bit more of a production cycle on each of these releases. It just made sense to put them in their own categories. So first, we'll start with the PC release. Bluehole used closed alpha and beta periods with about 80,000 players to gauge initial reaction to the gameplay and adjust balance prior to a wider release. Just prior to the early access phase on Steam, Bluehole opened a few servers and invited some popular live streamers of similar games to try it out to start gaining interest. In July of 2017, Green announced that they would need to extend the early access period by a few months, continuing to release updates on a regular basis with plans to still release by the end of 2017 as committing to this original period, quote, could hinder us from delivering a fully featured game and or leading to disappointment within the community if the launch deadline is not met, which we see in a lot of current games. Initially, Bluehole had expected that they would just gain enough players through early access to smooth out the gameplay, and only when the game was completed, they would have started making more marketing for the title. The sudden interest in the game from early access exceeded their expectations and put emphasis on the stability of the game and its underlying networking alongside gameplay improvements. Through August 2017, these updates generally included a major weekly patch alongside major monthly updates that provided key performance improvements. However, from August onward, Bluehole backed off the rate of such patches as the high frequency has led to some quality control issues, and the developers would rather make sure each patch content is well vetted by the community before providing new updates. This did not change their plans for 2017 release, where it fully released out of early access on December 20th. In part of the game's success in early access, Tencent Games, the largest publisher of video games in China, approached Bluehole that same month with an offer to publish Battlegrounds in China and purchase equity in the company. 
However, the China Audio Video and Digital Publishing Association issued a statement in October 2017 that discouraged Battle Royale style games, stating that they are too violent and deviate from Chinese values of socialism, deeming it harmful to young consumers. The following month, however, PUBG had reached a formal agreement with the Chinese government to allow the release of the game in the country with Tencent as the publishing partner. Some changes were made to make sure it aligned with socialist values and traditional Chinese morals. Despite the lack of a Chinese publisher prior to the Tencent deal, players in China had found ways to acquire and play the game through Steam via proxies and other networking tricks. To address it, PUBG Corporation planned to add maximum client ping limits for servers, which can reduce the issues with latency problems and prevent some of the cheating that has occurred. This would not prevent cross-region matchmaking, but would make it difficult for some players to play outside the region if they have a poor internet infrastructure. Tencent has also helped by identifying and reporting around 30 software programs to Chinese police that could be used to cheat in PUBG, leading to over a hundred arrests by the beginning of 2018. Separately, this technical issue, in addition to the larger number of Chinese players, has created complaints in the player community. Some Western players fear that many Chinese players are able to cheat in the game by exploiting some of the network latency issues, something that PUBG Corporation continued to address as the game shifted out of early access. However, a small number of players called for server segregation by region and had used racial insults at Chinese players they encountered in the game. Green was disappointed with this, quote, xenophobic attitude, calling it disgraceful, and asked the player community to respect the Chinese players more, as their numbers were a key part of the game's success. Green also identified that players can easily get around such region locks using virtual private networks, aka VPNs, making this approach ineffective. PUBG Corporation eventually added region-based matchmaking by October 2018, though players still reported issues with connectivity and slow matchmaking. So yeah, so I mean, all in all, to kind of say, yeah, it needed some region lock, at least in terms of making sure that there wasn't really any crazy latency issues and that you kind of played within your own region, give or take, so that it made the game smooth to play. Because it was tough. If someone jumps over and the ping goes wild and their character's darting across the screen or disappearing, and it just makes it not fun, especially for a game where you get one life. I mean, the the whole point of the game is very one, like, goal specific. So Mm -hmm. to have someone who's able to cheat through that gameplay style just totally uh, ruins the entire point of the game. So I understand the frustration. Yeah. Now, we did have a short-lived PUBG Lite which is a free version of Battlegrounds that is meant to be better playable on low-end computers by having significant reductions in graphic details and other features, but is otherwise feature complete with the full game. The version is meant to be played in regions where the game's minimum specifications may be difficult for average players to achieve, with a beta launch first releasing in Thailand in January 2019 and in Europe that October. Now, with a short-lived life, PUBG Lite was shut down on April 29th, 2021. Maybe the player cap never reached. Maybe it was just too difficult to keep up. Uh, you know, kind of a, I don't want to say a dumbed-down version of it, but, uh, you know, it might not be worth the effort and money put into a free version. Now let's jump over to the console releases. Green was part of Microsoft's press conference during E3 2017 to announce that PUBG would be coming to Xbox One as a timed console exclusive sometime by the end of 2017 using the Xbox Game Preview Early Access approach to test it. Initially, Green said that Microsoft was not directly involved in the porting, but only on providing assistance to make sure the port was good and that most of the porting responsibilities are being done by Antisto, a Spanish developer. However, at Gamescom that year, Bluehole affirmed that Microsoft Studio would be publishing the Xbox One version of the title, helping to make a planned 2017 release for the version. Green said that Microsoft's support has helped in several ways, not only 
for the Xbox One version, but improving the performance and security of the Windows version. Further, by being part of the group of studios under the Microsoft banner, they have been able to talk and incorporate technology from other developers, such as improved water rendering techniques they obtained from Rare that they used to develop for Sea of Thieves. Microsoft considered PUBG to be an important project to demonstrate their company's ability to be more than just a publisher, according to Microsoft's Nico Bihari, who led the project. Bihari said they have given Battlegrounds a, quote, white glove treatment, and for the Xbox One port, have provided services from their advanced technology group and time and support from the Coalition, another of Microsoft's subsidiaries. Kim also stated that the team was interested in cross-platform play between the Windows and console versions, but did not anticipate this as a future release, as they needed to determine how to mitigate the advantage keyboard and mouse using players would have over those using controllers. Titled Game Preview Edition, the early access version for the Xbox One was released on December 12, 2017 in both digital and physical formats. To promote it, Microsoft performed real-life supply crate drops in Australia in the week prior, with the crates containing Xbox hardware, Battlegrounds merchandise, and other goods, using passcodes published alongside the drop locations on social media. The Xbox version also includes Xbox-specific in-game cosmetic items, some of which could be purchased directly rather than through the in-game crates. The official release of the game preview version occurred on September 4th, 2018. Could you imagine a crate dropping from the sky? It's got Xboxes in it. Oh my God, dude, I would love it. And especially if no one told you it was happening. You're just some farmer in Australia just shearing your sheep and this plane just <laughs> drops this thing. That's oh essentially gosh. what Walmart did to me yesterday. Listen to the post-show patrons, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I that's, that's pretty much what it was. But again, I love these bits of marketing. They're over-the-top, silly things that are absolutely so much fun. And again, initially, there was no marketing. We had just that zero kind of dollar going with streamers and influencers. And then eventually with Papa Microsoft on board and later with Sony, we start to see a little bit of that dollar getting pushed towards being like, hey, it's available here. Come get it. Dollar daddy bill, baby. The old dollar daddy bill. That's a lot of alliteration, actually. (laughs) With the announcement of the Xbox release, PUBG Corporation stated that there were plans to port to additional platforms such as the PlayStation 4. In an interview shortly after Gamescom, Green said that their deal with Microsoft did not exclude a PlayStation 4 port, but that their focus at the time was only on the Windows and Xbox One version, given the small size of their team. When asked about it in January 2018, Kim stated that the team released the game first on the Steam and Xbox Game Preview Early Access programs, as they both easily allowed in-development games to be released and updated over time, which contrasted with Sony's lack of their own early access program, as well as their strict quality control for even completed games. The PlayStation port was officially announced in November and was released on December 7, 2018. PUBG Corporation studio head Brian Corrigan said that while they had a small team working on the PlayStation 4 port for some time, it was only until the Xbox One port was mostly completed that they began fully working on the PlayStation port. The PlayStation 4 version of the game includes platform-exclusive customization items, specifically the outfit of Nathan Drake from the Uncharted series and Ellie's backpack from The Last of Us. A short live-action film to promote the PlayStation 4 release was directed by Jordan Vogt Roberts and starred Jason Mitchell. So pretty cool. Again, you know, kind of having their own individual things, not only in-game content, but just really cool ways to push the game out. So yeah, we do finally see it on like the core consoles, and then we see it on a couple other little tidbits. Cross-platform play support between the Xbox and PlayStation versions of Battlegrounds was added in October 2019 following a testing period during the prior month. Player Unknown's Battlegrounds Pioneer Edition was released on the streaming service Stadia on April 28, 2020, and the game was free for Stadia's paid subscribers on launch. The old Stadia, exactly where I want to get my PUBG content. <laughs> 
Nothing like a little stadia, baby. You love to see it. And finally, this is where a lot of the controversies really come into it and a lot of the variations to the version, and that is the mobile version. Following the Chinese publication deal for the Windows version, Tencent Games and PUBG Corporation additionally announced that they were planning on releasing two mobile versions based on the game in the country. The first, PUBG Exhilarating Battlefield, is an abridged version of the original game and was developed by Lightspeed and Quantum Studio, an internal division of Tencent Games. The second, PUBG Army Attack, includes more arcade-style elements, including action taking place on warships and was developed by Tencent's Timmy Studio. Both versions are free to play and were released for Android and iOS devices on February 9th, 2018. The games had a combined total of 75 million pre-registrations and ranked first and second on the Chinese iOS download charts at launch. Following a soft launch in Canada, an English version of Exhilarating Battlefield, localized simply as PUBG Mobile, was released worldwide on March 19th, 2018. In China, PUBG Mobile had been awaiting approval by the government for an authorized release, during which the game could only be offered as a public test. However, Tencent's planned release was suspended due to the government approval freeze across most of 2018. By May 2019, Tencent announced it would no longer seek to publish PUBG Mobile in China, but instead would re-release the game under the title Game for Peace that readily meets Chinese content restrictions, such as limiting blood and gore. A version meant for lower-end mobile devices, which features a smaller map made for 60 players, PUBG Mobile Lite, was published on July 25th, 2019. This had support for high FPS gameplay on multiple Android devices, and of course, the Chinese version of the app was renamed Peacekeeper Elite in 2020. You know, in China, you just gotta keep that peace, and it's all about loving everybody and just doing good. China definitely does nothing wrong, ever. Nope. Support for 90 frames per second gameplay was added for selected OnePlus devices in August 2020. Pre-registration was opened for PUBG New State. On February 25th, 2021, the game would take place in the year 2051 and would be based on future warfare. And finally, on May 6th, 2021, Krafton announced the relaunch of the game in India, following the ban imposed by the government of India. Krafton directly published the game instead of Tencent as a newly named title, which could only be accessed by users in India as Battlegrounds Mobile India, which we will talk about down below about the controversy and the issues between China and India. Battlegrounds made $11 million in the first three days of its Windows Early Access release in March 2017. And by the second week of April, the game had sold over 1 million copies with a peak player count of 89,000. Super Data Research estimated that the game's April sales exceeded $34 million, putting it as one of the top 10 highest grossing revenue games for the month and exceeding revenue from Overwatch and Counter-Strike Global Offensive. By May 2017, the game had sold over 2 million copies with total gross revenues estimated at $60 million. Within three months of its early access release, it had surpassed over 5 million copies sold, and Blue Hole announced it had exceeded $100 million in sales revenue. PUBG reached this 4 million mark faster than Minecraft, which took over a year to reach similar sales figures while it was in its paid beta development state. So I wild. That's insane, right? That's mm -hmm. huge. By September 2017, Blue Hole's value, as tracked by a firm that tracks private Korean corporations, increased fivefold from June of that year to a value of $4.6 billion, primarily due to PUBG. By December 2017, PUBG Corporation reported that there were more than 30 million players worldwide between the Windows and Xbox versions. The research firm, Superdata, estimated that Battlegrounds drew in more than $712 million in revenue for 2017. Wild. By February 2018, the game had sold over $30 million on Steam, according to Steam Spy. The following month, Gabe Newell stated that the game was the third highest grossing game of 
all time on the Steam platform. It's insane how well this is done. And again, I know this game has fallen off, especially on a Western market, but it's amazing how much of an influence it really had early on. I mean, those are insane numbers. Those are top tier creme de la creme triple A title numbers that they pray to achieve. I mean, we go back to this is a developer who's going and following Twitch streamers and subscribing to them and paying, you know, that few hundred bucks a month to try and get this thing to blow up, succeeding in that Mm -hmm. and getting this game to be a worldwide maximum success. I mean, it's wild to see the development. No, it truly is. And we see why we have so many battlegrounds and battle royale spinoffs or, you know, that they're taking something from it. They're like, ooh, they have a lot of cheddar. They have an Italian cellar full of fine aged cheddar. And we would like to get some nibbles of that cheese. And so that's why we see Fortnite going from give hey, me them it's a, giblets, baby. Give me them cheesy giblets. Because we see Fortnite saying, hey, it's a uh, build a base and, you know, wave defense zombie game. And then be like, so about that. We're now a battle royale game that doesn't have zombies and you do this instead. And we see it pay off. Fortnite, obviously, a big pop of game. <laughs> That's a big boy game. That's a big boy game right there. While still in early access, PUBG won the best multiplayer game and was also nominated for the category's Game of the Year and Best Ongoing Game at the Game Awards 2017. The game's nomination for Game of the Year created some debate, being the first early access title to be named for one of the top industry awards. Now, the positives are there. Let's talk about the bans across the world and what's happened with it. In March of 2019, PUBG was banned by the Indian state of Gujarat after the local government decided the game was too addictive and an unnecessary distraction during exam season. A number of students caught playing the game were arrested as a result. The ban was not renewed in some cities in the state after March as exam season had ended. A similar ban was enacted in Nepal and Iraq in April 2019, with the cited reasons being that the game was harmful to children and teenagers. The ban in Nepal was shortly lifted by the country's Supreme Court, stating that the government could not enforce such a ban that interfered with personal freedoms without demonstrating why the ban was necessary. In mid-2019, Jordan and the Indonesian province of Aceh issued similar bans. So all across the world, we're seeing like too addicting, kids are failing school, at least that's what their reasons are, and the game's starting to get shut down in a lot of places. It's giving me big flappy bird vibes. Mm Mm-hmm. On July 1st, 2020, PUBG was banned in Pakistan by Pakistan Telecommunication Authority, citing the reasons that the game is addictive as a wastage of time and that it poses serious negative impact on physical and psychological health of the children after receiving various complaints from different segments of society and Lahore High Court's directions to look into the matter. However, the ban is temporary till further orders come from the court. The game continued to remain banned in Pakistan for a month. A meeting was held on July 30th, 2020 between PTA and legal representatives of Proxima Beta who addressed the queries raised by authority and emphasized a continued engagement and a comprehensive control mechanism after which the ban was lifted from PUBG. Amidst the ongoing 2020 China-India skirmishes, the Indian government banned PUBG Mobile along with more than 100 other Chinese apps, most made by Tencent and Natease, on September 2, 2020, asserting the apps were stealing and surreptitiously transmitting user data in an unauthorized manner to servers which have locations outside of India. India was PUBG Mobile's largest market, with the country accounting for 175 million with an M downloads and 24% of global users. So if you guys remember this, early in 2020, this was also when TikTok was under fire. India banned TikTok, leading to other countries to kind of like, do we boycott this? Do we go with it or not? You know, in the US, they had talked about banning TikTok for a minute. 
And this was huge. This was a huge hit to Tencent. This was a huge hit to PUBG for losing such an amazing player base. And that's why PUBG Corporation went ahead. Oh, okay, okay, we hear you. We hear you. We're going to go ahead and just make PUBG India for you. So that way we can continue to roll in that money and make sure that 24%, that is insane, of like the worldwide users will still be there. We're wrapping this up by letting you know that PUBG continues to add content to their game in an ever-increasing competitive market. In April of 2020, June H. Choi, the lead project manager of the PUBG console team, told the press that they added bots to the game to give a fresh start to new players who may feel intimidated playing with people who've been seasoned at the game. Many believe bots are either unfair or trick the player into thinking they're playing as real players. While the debate will continue as bots are added into more Battle Royale games and the speculation is that they're added to failing games, PUBG has continued to keep an excited player base across the globe. So yeah, so we're seeing these ebbs and flows, and I know we've been talking up to a lot of Western gamers in our Discord, just other people I know, PUBG is, quote, dead to them. However, it is insane how much money it has made and insane how much it is doing, like I said, in the Eastern half of the world in east asia and south asia all these different players that are keeping this game alive and keeping it running keeping it going it's simply amazing as we wrap up our coverage of player unknowns battlegrounds please as always why did we pick this game this game is so fun it is a lot of fun it's it's just in a battle royale setting which was like a fun concept but it's always sort of been how do you do it right I think that PUBG did it right. And I feel like it was a good stepping stone. I don't really feel like this is the definitive like battle royale game, I guess. Sure. And so to me, I'm glad that this game happened to give way for other games to show people not only the power of, you know, battle royale games, but also the power of Twitch marketing. You know, online marketing. People playing games. I feel like this game took that to the next level, made it a lot more interesting of a game, mm-hmm. great for the era that it existed in. I don't feel like this game has a lot of legs behind it. And for that reason, I'm going to give it a 6 out of 10. And that 6 is really just for the era it existed in. If I were to play this game now, it's more like a 5. Sure. I feel like this is a fun game, but it's so spammy. It's so weird. It's like you have to really be in love, I think, with PUBG to still be playing this game right now in 2021. And so that's where I feel like while it existed and did a great thing for the genre and was great in the era that it was made, it's not a game that I'm ever, ever, ever going back and saying, I want to play this again. Like, this was so fun. There are Mm -hmm. other things out there that do it better. So six out of 10. That's me. What about you? So understandable. And I want to bring up for our audience too that may not know, this style of game is, not, I don't want to say dead in the US, like that third person, first person perspective change for battle royales. It's not played here as much. We have those other games that are mostly first person perspectives. Now, if we're looking at the South American and the Asian markets, it's insane how influential that PUBG style is. If you look at, because I've just delved on Twitch sometimes, like, What's the Spanish market of Twitch doing? There's several games that are like PUBG styles, PUBG clones, made in the future, made in different eras, that all taste the exact, like way over the shoulder, third person loot pickup style. And they're doing it well. You know, they have the huge markets for it. So again, it's not a game that I think fit well in a Western, specifically EU, North American market, or that's continued to. It's ever expanded in those Latin American markets, in those pockets of Europe, in those East and South Asian markets. So it's a game that's interesting to talk about because it's not big here. So that's really why I wanted to cover it, to show you where the games have come from that you play today, whether that's any of the weird influential ones, whether that is Animal Royale which is a fantastic weird game, or Zombs Royale. Any of these weird little games that have broken off that are like those weird over-the-top styles, it's kind of like that. So if I had to rate this game, I would rate it hot dropping immediately onto the location where all the delicious loot is. Add in that I would die immediately every time and become frustrated. Then multiply that by saying, 
let's try that again. <laughs> and continuing to do it and basically reliving Far Cry 3 and being the villain and knowing that insanity is doing something over and over again with no change. And that is why I give this a beautiful Far Cry 3 out of 10. Wow. Very nice. You forgot Red Bull. You should throw in a Red Bull sponsorship right there. Yes, actually, you know what? Let me roll that back a bit. Weep, whoop, weep, whoop. That's the rewind sound for my review. I will also add in that the energy drinks are Red Bull TM trademark, hashtag please sponsor us, ad, hashtag detailed walkthrough, hashtag any other hashtags that'll get us that sponsorship. Thank you, Red Bull. Thank you, Red Bull. For just being around. (laughs) Thank you, Red Bull, PBR, Curel. Research for this episode was done by... Alex Kendall and Derek Baker, with assistance by Evan Barr, who also wrote, composed, recorded the intro and outro music for this episode. So thank you. Evan, you're beautiful. Also want to thank those who help us out monetarily and also get some perks with that. And that's everyone over to our Patreon. Again, our Patreon just went through a revamp. We've got some gaming servers for you, a D&D campaign, Ep- extra episodes, extra post shows, all this other stuff. We even did a special on the monetization of gaming, which features PUBG, which features, you know, even Halo Infinite coming out. We did a little breakup on that. So that is available as well. Um, So let's go ahead and uh, thank those supporters uh, today. And we've got Tactics, Sky the Bear, Grant Dillon, Mr. Choff, Trace, Mega, Nick Hyman, Richard Scanlon, McChief, Climbing Spork, Mr. 1898, William Crow, and Mr. Toot. So thank you all truly for the support. I'm trying so hard to memorize those names. And every time I'm thinking you're going to say like Mr. 1898, and I always miss it. If you haven't yet, please follow us on our social media accounts. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. We have a Discord. It's a lot of fun. Alex and I are hanging out in there all the time, and we'd love to see you there, interact with us, Mm -hmm. have a good time, talk about the episodes, talk about other gaming stuff. Please come and hang out. Absolutely. And if you want to see us slightly in person, but over a screen, check us out over at our Twitch channels at twitch.tv slash sourman70, that's S-O-U-R-M-A-N-7-0, as well as Derek's channel over at twitch.tv slash thebakerman70, that's the Baker Man 24-7. I messed that up uh, in that intro, so just pay attention to this one. That is 24-7. 247, baby. All the all the gaming you ever needed. 24-7. Absolutely. We're available on your favorite podcast listening platform. That's iTunes, Spotify, or wherever else you might get your podcasts. Please leave us a review if you haven't already. We appreciate it so much. It helps us out a lot. We love hearing the feedback from you guys, and we'd love to hear even more. 1,000%. And that is our coverage of Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, also known as PUBG, also known as PUBG Battlegrounds. What did you guys think of it? Did you guys play it on early access release? Have you played it in a while? Or are you a different fan that's like, hey, this is my go-to addiction that's not been in my country yet? <laughs> so how do you guys feel about the game? Let us know at all of our socials or Discord, wherever it is. And as always, I am your host, Alex Kendall. And I am your host, Eric Baker. And this has been Finish the Fight, a gaming podcast. <laughs>